Hey guys, welcome back. I hope you are having an amazing day. Let's get right into the stories. The first one is a pro-revenge story. I was in middle school back in the late 2010s, right when smartphones were starting to take over. I got my first phone, a basic flip phone, right before sixth grade started. It was a pay-as-you-go plan where calls cost 10 cents per minute and texts were 10 cents each too. Worse yet, sending or getting photos drained 25 cents from your balance each time. It was crazy expensive, and my parents only gave me $100 per year to use on the phone. If I went over, I had to cover it with my allowance and gift money. Luckily, most of my friends helped me conserve my balance. They'd call, I'd reject it, and then call them back from our landline. For messaging and pics, we used email or chat apps. Things were smooth until Josh joined our crew in 7th grade. At first, the guy seemed funny, but we quickly realized he was a total jerk. He stirred up drama within our group and problems with other kids too. Josh was manipulative, always playing the victim when called out on his BS. And he knew how to butter up parents, so getting rid of him was tough. He was the one pal who didn't respect my phone situation. Josh constantly texted me dumb meme pics, despite me telling him many times to just email those to me instead since picture messages killed my balance. Sadly, my plan didn't allow blocking numbers, so I was stuck as he spammed my phone. One day, Josh got mad at me over some dumb thing and unleashed a torrent of lolcat memes via text. He must have sent over 100 of them until my phone cut out after depleting my remaining $40 balance. I was livid and demanded he pay me back, but Josh refused, saying it wasn't his problem. I got home fuming and told my dad, expecting him to chew Josh's mom out and get that $40 back. But dad said some battles aren't worth fighting over $40. He took me to the carrier's store, loaded $50 on my phone, and forced them to block Josh's number after they initially claimed it wasn't possible on that plan. I was so paranoid about my number getting out and other kids draining my balance for kicks. Thankfully, my parents upgraded to iPhones with an unlimited text plan for our family that summer, and I got one too. Still, I remained pissed that Josh essentially stole $40 from me out of pure spite. Not long after, there was a huge blow-up between Josh and the rest of us, and we booted him from the group. He was a total outcast in 8th grade, with no one putting up with his crap anymore. Josh switched schools after that, and we never heard from him again. Fast forward a few years, and I'm back home for a stint between graduating college and starting my first real job out of state. One Saturday morning, I'm hitting up some garage sales when I stumble upon Josh's mom's place. I don't think she recognized me with my new glasses and beard look. There were some Pokemon napkins for sale, and when I asked about them, Josh's mom complained about her son's lifelong Pokemon obsession, saying she was sick of that stuff cluttering her house. She invited me in after I said the napkins could be for my little cousin who's really into Pokemon. She wondered if people still cared about that kid stuff and said Josh's old Pokemon collection was boxed up in the attic. I stayed chill, but I was secretly stoked when she brought down boxes jam-packed with Pokemon games, still sealed in their boxes. See, I knew Josh had been insanely obsessed with Pokemon. Back in the day, our whole friend group was into it when other kids thought it was lame, but Josh was on another level entirely. He'd brag constantly about owning every main Pokemon game in perfect condition, still boxed and pristine. I saw his collection once when he showed it off, yelling at me for daring to touch any of the games. Josh also had rare old Nintendo stuff in great shape, but Pokemon was his prize collection. His mom had damaged or tossed out some of his prized possessions before, not out of malice, but just clueless about their value. So so when Josh's mom brought down those attic boxes, I could hardly contain my excitement. We cracked open all the boxes, and it was an absolute gold mine. Pristine Pokemon games, still sealed. Vintage Nintendo consoles and hundreds of old school games. Boxes full of Pokemon trading cards, each meticulously kept in binders. And to my utter delight, a whole box of old Lego sets. Many of them classic Star Wars ones, all complete with instruction manuals and the works. When I spotted a Jango Fett set, I knew I'd hit the jackpot. Playing it cool, I asked Josh's mom how much for all five boxes of games, cards, and Lego stuff. She pondered for a sec and said $100 per box or $400 for the whole lot. I said I'd take it all and rush to the nearest ATM. 
I hauled those five treasure-filled boxes into my dad's truck and raced home, knowing I was potentially sitting on thousands, maybe tens of thousands, in collectible goods. It was the score of a lifetime, and I finally felt vindicated for that $40 Josh ripped off from me years ago. I gave the whole haul to my uncle, an eBay reselling hobbyist. He offered to sell everything for me, individually listing and auctioning off each item. Despite me insisting, he'd only take a 10% cut after fees and taxes. We went through and cataloged every single item with pricing estimates, and the entire lot was conservatively valued around $40,000. $40,000, a poetic number, given it was 1,000 times the amount that Punk Josh had stolen from me back in middle school. My uncle sold off most of it before summer ended and cut me a check, taking a lot less than that 10% cut he'd offered. While not the full $40,000, it was still an absolutely life-changing sum for me at that point. I was able to pay off my remaining student loans and treat myself to a down payment on a decent new car. The next one is an entitled people story. I've always been drawn to vintage and antique items. There's just something special about preserving pieces of history that I find meaningful. So when my great-aunt Beth passed away and left me her 1920s craftsman bungalow, I was thrilled. The house was like a time capsule filled with original features, built-in cabinets, arched doorways, a huge brick fireplace. Aunt Beth had lived her entire life in that charming little home. When I arrived to see the place for the first time, the neighbor from across the street immediately hurried over. Oh, thank goodness you're finally here, she cried dramatically. I'm Karen. I helped take care of your poor aunt in her final years. I reached out to shake Karen's hand. So nice to meet you, and thank you for looking after Aunt Beth. I'm Clara. Karen ignored my extended hand. Well, Clara, I hate to be the bearer of bad news, but you're too late. I already sold the place. My mouth fell open in shock. Wait, what? You sold my aunt's house? Yes, just yesterday, actually, Karen replied matter-of-factly. You didn't arrive in time so I took it upon myself to handle everything. I found a lovely family to move in. I was completely flabbergasted. This woman had some nerve-selling property that wasn't hers. Trying to keep my cool, I said, Karen, I think there's been some major misunderstanding here. That is my property, left to me in Aunt Beth's will. You had no right to sell it. Karen scoffed. Well, I never heard anything about a will. Beth knew I was the only one actually taking care of her. She obviously wanted me to have the place. I shook my head in disbelief. I assure you I have the legal paperwork proving the house belongs to me. Ridiculous, Karen snapped. The new owners already moved in this morning with their things. You're wasting your time. This was quickly escalating into a mess. I got the sudden feeling Karen was trying to scam me and make some quick cash off my inheritance. Well, if she wanted a fight, she was going to get one. Karen, what you've done is completely illegal, I said firmly. That is my property and I need to ask the family to leave immediately until this gets sorted out. Karen planted her hands on her hips defiantly. Absolutely not. I will not have you barging in and harassing my buyers. If you set one foot on that property, I'm calling the police and having you arrested for trespassing. Wow, this woman had some nerve. But I refused to keep arguing back and forth. It was time to take real action. You know what, Karen, go right ahead and call the police, I said, because we're going to need some officers here to set the record straight. I promptly pulled out my cell phone and dialed cop myself. I gave the dispatcher all the details about my aunt's property and Karen wrongfully selling it off. They assured me someone would be on their way shortly. Within ten minutes, a police cruiser rolled up. Two officers stepped out and I hurried to give them my side of the story. Karen immediately tried interrupting, making all types of crazy accusations against me. But thankfully, the officers shut her down fast. Ma'am, we're going to need you to be quiet and let this woman speak, the older officer commanded. I confidently described the situation, explaining I had the legal documents proving my ownership and that Karen had taken it upon herself to unlawfully sell of my property. The officers asked to review the paperwork, which I gladly provided. Karen was practically fuming, but she couldn't do anything as I showed the officers no doubt I was the rightful owner. They turned to Karen and asked for any proof validating her claims. Well, um, I don't have the papers with me, but Beth totally promised I could have the place, Karen stammered unconvincingly. The officers were not amused. So you're admitting that you sold this property without any legal claim to it? 
Karen's face went red. She scoffed and held her hands up defensively. Fine. I was just trying to help take matters into my own hands. The cops made it clear Karen had no legal grounds and what she did was considered fraud. They agreed to head to the house and talk to the family she had moved in to explain the invalid sale agreement. Thankfully, the officers saw Karen was completely in the wrong and were on my side. We all headed across the street together, with Karen trailing behind, looking utterly defeated. As we approached the charming 1920s bungalow, the door opened, and a man holding a baby stepped onto the porch, looking confused by the spectacle. The cops explained to him that Karen did not actually own this property and had no right to sell the place to them. Understandably shocked, the man insisted they had signed a lease and even paid a deposit already. I felt awful this innocent family was now caught up in Karen's mess. The officers advised the man that, regrettably, the agreement was fraudulent. They would need to vacate the premises promptly so that I, the verified homeowner, could take possession. But that Karen may be held liable for any costs they had incurred related to her false sale. The man looked disgusted, demanding his money back from Karen immediately. She tried to insist it was all just a misunderstanding. But the cops weren't going to let her off the hook, sternly stating she engaged in unlawful misconduct. As the family went inside to hurriedly pack up their belongings, I let out a sigh of relief. The vintage bungalow was finally back in the right hands. Karen was left angrily pacing while the officers discussed charging her with criminal fraud. In the end, I decided not to press charges. The family Karen scammed did get fully reimbursed by her, and she never showed her face again, knowing she was caught red-handed in her deceitful ploy. I spent that first night happily sleeping in my Aunt Beth's charming home, feeling her with me in spirit. This house held such precious memories and history. Thanks to the honest police officers, I was able to reclaim my rightful inheritance, and set the record straight from the lies of a shady scammer named Karen. The next one is a petty revenge story. My senior year of high school, my younger brother committed suicide. This and other events caused me to spiral. Drugs, five years. But nowadays, it's going on four years since I've used hard drugs. Most of my 20s were dark and lonesome, though. My family didn't want anything to do with me after a while because it hurt them to witness. There's been a lot of healing in that regard, and I finally, on good terms with them again. After I got clean about a year or so in, I took a try at online dating. I was quickly hit with a dose of reality. Women didn't find me attractive. I was still a little overweight. I had one date and the woman never spoke to me again. I even went online to look up some advice, too embarrassed to tell anyone about it in real life. That was when I learned even guys that are way more accomplished in life and have model looks, they also don't get nearly any attention online either. My confidence wasn't strong enough to handle repeated blows to my ego. So I knew I was better off deleting Bumble, continue making strides in my sobriety, and most of all lose a few LBs. And with some luck, I was able to get a physically demanding, better paying job to counteract my concerns about being sedentary. Picked up walking around the local park in my neighborhood, then the unexpected thing happened and I started dating a co-worker at my new job. That's when a friend of my GF alerted us to a post she came across. It had screenshots of my old Bumble profile, the pictures, the bio, Private info, my first middle last name, full birthday, my cell phone number, my home address, and last but not least, the address and phone number to the job I used to have, with a caption that said something to the effect of me unmatching her on Bumble before she could get a chance to message me. But she took the time to screenshot my profile before even trying to reach out, IG, and then further claimed she had learned from a friend of hers that knew me personally I am married and my wife had to leave the state to be safe from me. The post was from almost two years ago, and again, if it's not obvious, I have never married. And it really embarrassed me because I was so far from ever being husband material throughout my 20s and I'm still working on myself to potentially be a great long-term partner to my girlfriend. And for this woman to claim that I was somehow already at that stage of life, that I had a marriage, was able to afford it, and then violently destroyed it, it was violating. My GF's friend even shared with us screenshots of the comments that were under it. And that part was devastating, because not one person asked her to prove any of it. Not one person asked her to consider the harm it could cause by putting all my address information online to strangers. Not one person called out the obvious that she was retaliating over a perceived rejection. Also, I don't even remember her face. I'm 100% confident she never matched with me on Bumble. I got so few matches back then. But the comment section did agree on one thing, that. Men who look like me are secretly gay, and that's why they beat women. I cried about this for days. 
I couldn't fathom that this group on Facebook was all women my age and older and behaving like the same kind of attitudes of middle school children who taunted my younger brother so much that he committed suicide. There's not a day that goes by that I don't think about my little brother. But never has it been because I was on the receiving end of what my brother went through. And it made me so fired up, I just kept thinking to myself, they got away with bullying my brother, and I can't let them keep getting away with it. So my GF and I agreed we'd do something. My GF had already been using a fake Facebook act to follow this woman's Facebook act, and sadly like most people. This woman is addicted to social media. She posts a new picture of herself every day. Oftentimes the same picture with different filters, which is a level of depressing I can't describe. But it made me feel sorry for her in a way. She literally posts everything, including a list of several other people she has done this too. That part really highlighted the urgency to act in both me and my GF. Because it wasn't just a one and done for her, I was not the first. She has doxxed at least five people, and one is a woman. The reason she went after a woman is because apparently she is in an open relationship with one of the guys that rejected her. There's varying different levels of encounters she has had with, some she's met, but it's hard to believe if any of what she put was true because she completely completely made crap up about me. Now I'm assuming she must use some crowdsourcing from other members, but as far as the private phone number and address and full names, I think she uses one of those Spokio type websites. I have an arrest on my record for trespassing and drug paraphernalia. If she was intent on sharing accurate information to others, I question why she couldn't just bring up that factual arrest record. My GF and I didn't need any more speculation. It was clear this is an ill and predatory lizard parading around as a feminist vigilante. It was only by sheer luck that I moved jobs around the time of this posting. Plus, combined with my GF and I aren't on any social media. We only have the fake Facebook account we used for this occasion. Because if we were, the would have been harassing us directly. So my GF and I used her Facebook activity against her. First of all, she posted where she works a daycare ran by a church. She always posts when she's at home, when she's going to work. So we went up to the daycare when she was at home. We printed out screenshots of all the men and women she is non-consensually sharing photos and address of. We included the posts where she is egging other women to review bomb the places they work. We spoke with the director of the daycare, and we were surprisingly well received, and we all were able to figure out that much of her time at work is spent on Facebook, and that includes when she's doxing people. Two weeks ago, I got an email from the director. He explained that they fired her on grounds of harassment in the workplace. We still use our fake Facebook ACT to monitor her. She's just created a GoFundMe to help pay her rent. But my GF and I are going to see to it that is shut down for harassment and fraud. She's done this to so many people, I have no doubt she will ever figure out which one of us finally came after her. The next one is a malicious compliance story. So I was a software engineer at Google and then moved to another company who headhunted me for a buttload of money. They wanted to be able to tell clients that they had an ex-Googler leading the client's project. Because I was headhunted, I managed to get a lot of special perks. I made them guarantee me X numbers of days off per year, made sure I got no tier one on call, etc. Anywho, this company was very badly managed. They had a policy of giving completion deadlines for the end of the month, which often resulted in multiple deadlines being on the same day. In fact, they were smart enough to guarantee completion on the 31st of December to one client. Obviously, that project didn't go as planned, as a ton of people took time off, and along with the holidays, it was a few days behind. They decided that they would cancel leave of as many people as they could, but were nice enough to encourage us to do it ourselves. Luckily, they sent an email. Given I was the team lead, they asked me to stay too. Now, as I mentioned earlier, I had negotiated a nice little point of guaranteed days off per year, and it was structured such that I got 20 days off every year, five of which I was guaranteed I could take the year I got it. In fact, it was structured weirdly enough that I almost had to take it off, and even I couldn't waive it. I emailed our director to confirm he wanted me to cancel my vacation, and it was more of a guideline than a request. Once I got the confirmation, I canceled my vacation. Bottom line, it was a fun battle with HR the next month, but I got paid 3x for those 5 days and got those days forwarded to the next year. I didn't stay long enough. By then, I had around 25 days off, took them off, and right after I took them off, I submitted my resignation. Later I heard that the company lost a bunch of contracts and wasn't able to pay salaries because of how badly they were managed. The next one is an entitled people's story. Context. Both my uncle and I work in the same professional services industry. 
Think Consulting, Legal, Investment Banking, ECT. He is a partner at a regional mid-tier firm, and I am professional staff at a larger international one. I am not a lawyer, banker, or consultant. I'm professional staff. My degree is in information science, and my job revolves around the research database and tools everyone needs to do their jobs, talking to stakeholders about what information they need, negotiating the licensing deals, setting up training sessions, and making sure everyone knows what resources they have access to. I spend a lot of time talking to our vendors and understanding what are allowed to do with the data we have access to as per our contracts. Depending on the sensitivity of the data and the contract's terms of use, using a resource to do personal research is at best tacky and at worst a violation of federal law. Story time. While on the clock today, I get a call from my uncle and pick it up. Already I regret doing this. I've asked him repeatedly not to call me during office hours because I am busy and he is the most long-winded person I've ever met. I've begun to realize that his lack of respect for people he considers beneath him is feature, not a bug. My time is less valuable than his. After complaining about how my cousin made family dinner this weekend, which he didn't lift a finger to cook, the real news came out. He had volunteered me to help his 93-year-old aunt, my great-aunt, with some company research and to expect an email from her shortly. Me. Great, I'm happy to help her out and I've got the skill set to do so. When I am at home and not using my work computer or databases. Him. Oh, so you can access X financial database on your personal laptop? Me. No, I can't use my firm license to do personal work. I'm going to use the open web. There are a lot of public records resources I can use since this is a public company. Also, as a public library card holder, I have access to a bunch of useful business resources. Him. Never mind, I'll get my analyst to do it for me. His analyst is a professional colleague of mine. I know for a fact she was hired by the firm to do research for the firm, not for whims of my uncle. Note that he did not offer to do the research himself. If someone is going to violate a contract, it won't be him. It is highly unlikely, but she could be putting her job at risk for saying yes to his request. Better the analyst lose her job than him. Me. Okay, she really should not be doing that. Him. She does personal stuff for me all the time. Me. I never heard that and we never had this discussion. Goodbye. My great aunt emailed me a few minutes later. I'll be helping her out using public resources only. Thank you for watching. I would really appreciate it if you could like the video and subscribe to our channel if you haven't already. We'll see you again tomorrow.